Hello, Anthony. Part three. John would like to know, do those real life punters who used to deal with you when you were in trading rooms now operate directly with you to get their bets on because they're barred from getting on with other bookmakers? And do you use, if that's correct, do you use their stuff to your benefit? Um, people that I used to deal with. Yeah, I've had a couple of people just actually from previous, like, I think there's a trade off between like I, for years and years, I didn't speak to anyone, came off social media, didn't speak to anyone. And I think everyone, or people assumed that I was probably, probably winning money, but like getting it quietly and stuff like that, fair enough. And I think, but then since I've done a few podcasts recently, and I obviously spoke to you last week as well, um, and then you get you, you get people saying that oh, you shouldn't you should keep your mouth shut, and then you get and then the flip side of that is you get people saying that you yeah you, you're not telling us anything and stuff like that, and this is rubbish, and you you can you can't win with people. But I think what what I found has happened is I think the smarter people just realise what's being said, and I think the people that probably are less smart in the punting get more frustrated by what you're saying. Um, I've had people reaching out to me since, like I've spoke with spoke with someone I consider to be right at the top of the game, basically, um, just regarding horse racing. Last week, um, just after seeing the videos, I've had somebody, one of the smart customers I mentioned from Betfred, uh, not Jason Knowles, but another lad, uh, reached out to me and got in touch with me as well and wants to meet me and stuff like that. So, like, I think, uh, I think the whole networking thing is I was late to it. And I think overall it's a, it's a big positive. Um, I don't just I don't follow in people. I'm more interested in how people think than what bet they're going to give me. To be honest with you, and what I can learn about how they approach things. Uh, I'm never if I meet a trainer at the races or something like that. I'm never give me a winner. What, what do you think is going to win today? I think that's real short sighted and it's real. It's gonna. It's, it's like the feed feed a man with a fish for a day or whatever that friggin' saying is. It's like it's. A, I think you're going to get something out of it for the day maybe, but you don't learn anything for yourself in the in the in the future. And my whole thing is if I met the smartest guy in the world at betting, I don't want to know why he's betting today. I want to know how he goes about finding his bets, basically. And that's kind of the way I approach it. I, just, I don't want, I don't like your man was saying there, John, uh, I don't want individual bets off people. I just want to be, I want to be around them just to learn something about how they process information and stuff like that. And how they, how that then generates bets rather than, rather than getting one or two bets off them, basically. That's, that's how I approach it with, any smart people I deal with. Okay, now, Pattaya John, as a golf punter myself, um, I'm interested in your views on golf betting. Is it a big thing for you? Or was there a particular reason for punting Ram in the Memorial last year? Uh, yeah, I like betting on golf. I think I've got a good edge on golf. Um, from back in the day, I was probably on premium charge on Betford because of golf more than anything else. Um, yeah, I think I, I like. Yeah, I think golf is golf's a good sport to bet on. Basically, I'd I'd be very frustrated if I was a golf trader or a, working for a firm that was offering seven, eight, ten places every week, because I think when you start when you start going eight and ten places, your opinion just doesn't matter anymore. Basically, it's kind of you're struggling to lay anybody any kind of bet. Um, it's probably not a sustainable market and sure what you might as well just pay someone minimum wage to put copy prices if you're going to be offering eight and ten places which are which is probably what one of the firms that offers the big places prices does anyway um yeah I, like golf's good to bet on but i wouldn't want to work for a bookmaker on price golf to be honest with you because because you're just uh, like i think it's just very tough i think it's probably very tough to to have your opinion doesn't matter basically the, the each way terms are going to dictate what what prices you're going to have to go on probably more so than having any opinion so if i had any opinion I, i'd want to on golf i'd want to work for a firm that offered sustainable each way terms or i'd want to pump myself um but yeah everyone's different i suppose um yeah golf golf's golf's a good sport to bet Okay, this is from Matt Swad, and he, I quote, I do actually have a question rather than just being a knobhead dropping quotes. Would a small minimum bet law, for example, 250 quid um, liability per a market per firm, um, would that have a positive effect going forward? 
Um, I've probably changed my opinion about this, to be honest with you. Um, like I said, I don't really bet certain things because of you can't get a bet on them. Horses, dogs, things like that. I probably would have been of the opinion originally that firms can do what they want and and they can restrict who they want. And But I think... I think it's probably a little bit short term doing that. Like I, I genuinely fear for horse racing in the UK, not just prize money, not just everything, but like how many people, I used to love horse racing. I used to watch it. I used to own horses. You might not want to lay my bets on them, but I used to watch it. I was engaged in it. I used to go racing all the time as a punter. I don't even watch it anymore. I barely watch it anymore. So even though the bookmakers might say, oh, thank God, like uh, I, we're not going to lay him any bets on horse races anymore. The sport has probably lost me as a customer and lost me as a fan. And if that's happening to me, honestly, it's happening to a lot more people on a lot smaller scale than me as well. And I think it's just real short term of the sport to be to be probably siding a little more, little more with the bookmakers and being able to do what they want rather than it's probably turning off a lot of people that were your customers and they're just gravitating to other sports. Um, so yeah, my minimum bet law, minimum bet's interesting. I think, I think the firms, it's the same as guarantee prices. When the firms bought in guarantee prices, that if you struggle to get rid of it because people expect it, and it's it's a big big drain. I'd love to. Bookmakers would make so much more money if they remove guaranteed prices, and they added a minimum bet law of five hundred quid to everybody at the price. Guaranteed prices cost cost them millions as an industry. It definitely cost them eight figures a year as an industry of the firms on our check at least at least eight figures. Um, bringing in the minimum bet law wouldn't cost them that much. Your prices like you're going to lose money to certain customers, but your prices are going to get more efficient more quickly, and you're going to get put away less. It's probably going to reading between the lines of your mark of your P and L. It's probably not going to cost you that much money to bring in. And it's not going to turn people off. I'd probably have a bet to win a monkey on horses and I'd probably look at it and I'd, I'd expect they wouldn't beat me, but I wouldn't win by that much. And you'd correct your prices easier and everyone would be happy and people would go racing again a little bit more. So the way I do it, I think that's all pie in the sky because I don't think it's going to happen anyway. But the, And I also don't think my idea with it is going to happen. But my idea would be, Anyone that offered markets, every every price on your website, if you were laying a bet to win 500 quid, I'd tax you less. I'd tax you less. I'd have two levels of tax. If you want to go bet 365, you get restricted. Your account email, you all get a quid on and you can play in the casino. I'd tax them twice as much, three times as much as I would the guys that had laid you a bet to win 500 quid on anything. And I think that is one way that the that government and regulators could solve Um making bookmakers incentivizing bookmakers to deal with customers basically that that they're probably not going to find pro as profitable as people who lose all the time is by having different levels of taxation um on, on your gross profit basically okay right adam he's interested in the gray and derby anti-post market is that pricing up every runner correctly at the start and every round back in loads each way or just making a market uh, Graham Derby's, yeah, price them all up. I usually tend to not have a bet before the first round, so I'd price everything, do my work on it all. I'd probably watch the first races. I'd be tracking draws. Draw, the drawing grounds is massive, so which way, which way dogs are turning out the boxes, basically, is probably the biggest thing. How anyone can have a bet on grounds without knowing a draw is beyond me. It's, it's a massive part of it. Um, so yeah, I'd be looking at draws. I'd, I tend to usually want to watch them run, unless I see something that I think is very, very overpriced. I'll usually watch them run the first round. I'll get my draw for the final 96. I'll go through it all. I'll be looking who's got good draws, who's got bad draws. And yeah, it's pretty much having each way bets. And it's not as relevant anymore, but Star would have been one of the ones that did it. Labrook's Powers back in the day when I was at Powers, Bet365, they all used to price a lot of special markets. You still get them to a degree on the English Derby. Nobody prices specials pretty much on the Irish Grand Derby anymore. Um, and yeah, it'd be like Top Mark, Wallace Dog, and they'd be just analysing analyzing stuff and having bets in those markets as well, as well as as well as each way bets, basically, anti -force. Okay, punting for a living, we'd like to know. One minute you're working for Paddy Power, the next minute you got a 200,000 plus tank plus the multi bet. How did you get that sort of tank up? 
originally. I suppose he means without the multiple. Yeah, one minute in reality was 10 years. So I wish it was one minute, but it was 10 years. So it was a, it was a while. It took me a while to get going. Um, like one of my one of my first bets, a few people would know from Powers that got me got me really going was Luis Suarez, top Premier League goal scorer. He joined Liverpool. He was banned. I think it was his first full season. I had him top scorer. It was 20 to 1. Quarter of the first four. I think I was betting him at 18, 16. I was betting him a good few prices down. And he missed the first five games of the year. It might have been one, might have been his first biting incident or pushing a rep or something like that. So he, no, he's banned for six games, I think. Or it might have been five, it might have been five league games. And he came back. I think I can remember it. Robin Van Persie was top scorer. It might have been David Moyes' first season at United. Van Persie was top scorer for United in the Premier League. He had six goals. Suarez hadn't played a game at that point. Um, and he played his first game back was a League Cup game away at United. I think someone won one now. Might have been United. I'm not sure. And I watched that game intently because I had it in my head that Suarez was a massive price at 20 to one quarter of the first four. Um, and I watched that game, and he didn't score in the game, but he was he was his usual self. He was buzzing around, doing his Suarez Tevez like running around, harrying people, playing well. And I just thought it was just a massive price, basically. And I, I probably had, this was probably 2013, I probably had three grand, four grand to my name. Didn't have much money. And I basically had it all on him each way. I had about two grand each way on him, 1,800 each way or something. And won, I don't know, won the guts of 50 grand, basically. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the bet that got me going, basically. Um, from, from, it probably got me from being a 5K, 10K bank guy to having 50K and then, and then I really, I think after that bet won, I remember, I, I'll tell you what, I remember that because the English Grand Derby that year, Suarez at the time, this was the start of May, Suarez was like one or two to be top scorer. And there was a guy at Paddy Power called Luke Cotton, who probably, and I didn't know him, I'd never met him, and I know him really well now. And he had a few quid, <laughs> shall we say, and he lent me, he basically lent me 20 grand it, without knowing me, crazy really, against my Suarez bet. He knew that he had the Suarez bet as, as his credit basically. And he wanted to follow me. He'd heard about the bets I was doing and stuff. And he wanted to follow me on the English Grand Derby. Um, and we basically had about 40 grand between us. We split the bets half, half, 20 grand, 20 grand. And it was the year, I think it was the year, I might be getting confused here now. It might have been the year Salah Dodger won the, won the derby I, that might have been a different year but, but basically we pretty much doubled our money um, so I had the Suarez money about 50 grand coming back and then Luke owed me about 20 grand after the English derby as well so basically at the end of that May start of that June I had 70 grand and then I kicked on for, and then I just with that 70 grand thing you do the bits and pieces you probably buy a few new clothes and go on holiday and stuff like that and then when I got back I was just like I'm going to I'm not going to prick around now. I'm actually going to take this very, very seriously from here because I can probably make money on it. And that's kind of what I did, basically. And I, I, this is my question because I'm, I'm probably a bit cautious when I bet, but um, what sort of percentage of that bank, do you split them into like points and have that on of your total bank? No, never, mate, never. No, I've never done that. It's, it's going back to one of them previous questions. It's probably on how big I think the mistake is and, and what kind of market I can get on it if, yeah, it's just how big the mistake is. And I'd never, once you've got a few quid and everyone's different, everyone's got mortgages and bits and pieces like that. But um, I think the bigger the bigger the bigger the mistake, the bigger your edge, you probably should be having more money on them things. And and that's basically it. I never I thought I'm not one of these one point each way, do me a one point win on this. I'm more fucking I've got 10 grand in my bank. I can get three grand on this and it's 50% too big. Let's get it on. Like that's that's just the way it is. Okay, right. Finally, this is from a previous interviewee, Rich Hassel. He's a very successful professional dog punter. He says, four episodes of Not Match was a giant tease. I'd like to hear some method, how he picks his selections. Um, and also, what is an edge you used to play that no longer works? And if you don't pick your own, how do you get others' cards and info? There's a few questions in there from Rich, but he's, uh, he's keen to learn off you. Sorry for teasing, Rich. Um... Uh, pick my selections yeah like 
cards and in fourth other people not so much not so much um I'm always willing I always keep my ears open and my mouth shut in general um edges that used to work uh one big one back in the day would have been Stan James I used to love Stan James I used to think the format it's like playing champ manager 97 98 like the format of the the layout of Stan James's website used to be brilliant I used to think it was one of the best websites it's a shame it's gone but it also used to have numerous flaws in it as well. So you used to you used to lay your 30 quid max on a top jockey market and you stick it in a bet with uh, hundreds on basketball team and you can have 300 quid on and stuff like that. So like there was loads of, uh, there was loads of little flaws in the logic of their website. And they're probably like one big edge that I used to have was the Premier League season handicaps and not done it for ages. I actually got an email after our pod off a Boyle Sports shop manager who basically remembered a perm that I'd done in a Boyle Sports shop that he used to manage basically from six or seven years ago, which was quite amusing to to remember. Um, but yeah, used to one of my big 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 starting point was West Brom plus forty six with Stan James on a season handicap. It was the year Blackpool started off really well and then faded away, um, and. Yeah, I had, I had a, I basically West um, Stan James massively priced West Brom wrong on the season handicap, but it revised every single week. So whatever year Blackpool were in the Premier League under Ian Holloway, they had about a fifty point head start, and because they went off ten to the dozen and they started off really well, they were miles ahead of everyone in the season handicap. But West Brom were always within touching distance. Um. And Stan James just used to revise it every week and they were revising it like six to one and it was quarter the first four for ages. Like like 15 of the teams couldn't couldn't place and they were still a quarter of the first four. It was just crazy. And you, you couldn't lose on it, basically. Um, West Brom were like guaranteed to place and I was just betting them every week. I was doing like 15 quid each way doubles with horses. And I think my Stan James account at the end, like in March, would have been showing like minus seven grand, but it was seven grand of open bets um, and basically West Brom just came at the end and pipped them with about three or four games left um, as, as Blackpool got relegated basically and uh, that was a massive mistake. Stan, another one Stan James used to do which the first time I ever went to the Caribbean was based on Stan James pricing up jockeys challenges. They used to pick like two jockeys every day so it was like two jockeys at Lingfield and jockey A, jockey B and it'd be like they'd have five rides each and say all the rides were five to one, five to one times five for both jockeys. And you'd get to like quarter and then whoever used to set it up, used to just leave it. So you'd have all the movement of the early prices. But then also you'd get certain days where there'd be some jockey A would be on two odds on shots and they were both non-runners. And the prices would just be the same. Like, and they, they might have one ride against a guy who's got four rides and a couple of on don shots, and they were 10 to 11, 10 to 11. And you're just like, it's fucking, it's a hundred on. Like, you literally can't lose. And we used to just perm them up, or me and another lad in Powers used to perm them up and just take fortunes off them and just keep getting accounts and just doing that. And we were pressing that for ages. They had no rule to say that if there was a non runner, you didn't. I was just mad. They must have lost. Fortunes on whoever was pricing that market did me a big turn, basically. So, yeah, good. Excellent. Well, that you've been a good sport. They've answered every single question <laughs> that um, I think. If I hopefully I didn't miss any off of Twitter, so um, plenty for people to get their teeth into there, and they've everyone's learned something. I should imagine, Anthony. Thank you very much, and uh, really appreciate it. No worries, man. See you again.